Today I'm going to take a look at a product that I'm actually really excited to try out, and that is this PDU. This is the PowerPDU 4C from a company called Netio, and this just seems like a really cool product, and we'll get into why I think that. Now, first of all, because I want to be fully upfront, I have to say a massive thank you to, Net for, to Netio for sending this over for me to take a look at. So just because I always want to be very transparent, they have sent me this free of charge to look at, but they're not telling me anything to say. They've not paid me to make the video apart from giving me the product, and they're not seeing this video before it goes live. So I'll be giving my honest opinion. But when they emailed me asking if I wanted to take a look at this, I absolutely jumped at it because I, it just seems like such a fantastic device and it's really what I wish smart and IoT type products were more like. Admittedly, it's probably quite that sad that I got that excited over a PDU, but we'll go into it and I'll show why. Now, as with most of my videos, but in particular with this one, I suspect this video is going to be really long. So if you're interested in a specific part, I'll put the chapters in the video seek bar and I'll also put them down in the description so you can skip to the part that you're interested in. So Netio is a company based in the Czech Republic I think they're quite small and quite new, and they make PDUs and smart power distribution type stuff. But what they seem to have done is they seem to have got quite an interesting niche market that they've targeted that isn't really targeted by any other product. With most PDUs, the ones I tend to think of, I'm thinking of the ones you'd have in server racks, the ones from APC, CyberPower, Eaton, Austin Hughes, those types of PDUs. They're designed for data center use. They're big, large things, can carry huge amounts of current, and they've got management, but the management's usually either a web interface or a serial or telnet or SSH interface that's like a user interface that you go into, it gives you menus and you press keys to navigate through it. And they're great for that sort of environment because you can remotely reboot your servers, you can check health, stuff like that. On the other end of the scale, you've got things like smart plugs. Just little TP-Link type smart plugs, you plug in, you connect it to an app, the cloud account probably, and you can switch your lamp on and off. But what Netio target is a market that neither of those really cater for. And that is where you need a PDU or power switch type device or power monitoring type device that you can integrate with other systems using open APIs. So we'll try all these out when we actually get into it. But to give a little teaser, this thing natively out of the box supports MQTT, HTTP APIs, Telnet APIs. You can even run Lua code directly on it to have it run scripts to work based on the power usage or to communicate, over the, communicate out over the network. So we'll try all these out but it's just such an open device to work with compared to a lot of other devices that either require accounts and cloud access or have interfaces that are really designed for users and not designed to be integrated with other machines and other computer software. So let's look at it. Now this particular model I have here, as I mentioned, is the 4C. They do a bunch of different models and they all come in different form factors. They do these ones which are more metal rack mount type form factors or wall mount, I suppose. They also do ones that are either just a single cable with a plug on one end and a socket on the other for a single device. They then do ones that are more like trailing sockets that you can plug normal plugs into. And they also do a really cool one that is DIN rail mounted so you can mount that inside an enclosure and actually integrate it into the system through a, on a, in a DIN rail enclosure. The website is quite clear and shows it all, but the difference is that while I mentioned all those protocols and things like the Lua scripting, that's different between all the devices. Not all of them support all of those options. So the reason I went with the 4C is just because this supports all the protocols that they offer really. So I thought I would take this because I can demonstrate all the protocols and if you're going to buy one of these you can then look for one that's maybe, maybe this one or maybe a different one in a different form factor that you prefer but at least you can then know what all the protocols are like so you can pick one that has the protocols you need. So this is it here, very simple box, nothing really fancy at all. And let's take a look at what we get. So, pop this open, it's very basic packaging but you get a manual which is just a very quick quick started guide. It really just shows you how to connect it up, get into the web interface. There's discovery software you can run on Windows if you want that to help find it on the network, but I just use other IP scanning software for that. Then just some basic stuff about like resetting and stuff. So nothing particularly complicated at all. There's the PDU itself, take a look at that later. And finally, in terms of other accessories, all we get is just a power cable. I got a Euro plug with mine, just because they shipped it directly, but that's fine. It, 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 it does have a thing on the side of the box saying UK, so you could probably order it with the right correct, correct plug, but it's just an IC cable, so I can just use another one I've got. And now, with the PowerPDU 4C itself. So let's go in close and take a look at this and do a tour of it, and then we'll try it out and see what it can do. So here we have the PDU itself. It's a very plain device, but it's quite a nice little thing. Nice metal enclosure, feels decent quality. First of all, we'll take a look at the front. So on the front here, we can see we've also got the branding. 
we've got a set of four buttons and a set of four LEDs above. And these just indicate the outlet states. You can also then press these buttons in and that just lets you turn the outlets on and off. By default, you can you need to hold them down for a couple of seconds to switch the output, just to stop them being bumped by accident. But yeah, you can manually control the outlets from the front, which is really nice. That's something that a lot of data center PDUs don't have because they're designed to be controlled remotely and you'd never need to control it from the device itself. So it's nice to actually have that so you can actually just toggle the outputs manually using these buttons. Next up, you have a serial port. This is something that not all of them have, but the 4C does, and this can be really useful. So this is an RS-232 serial port. It doesn't look like one just because it's only got three pins, but that's it there. You've got your ground, your RX, and your TX pins into a standard terminal block that you can wire cables and wire, stick wires into. And it actually unplugs that's nice. You can unplug it, wire it, and then plug it in. So you don't have all of the pins from serial, but most serial devices will still work with just the ground, RX, and TX. You just need to maybe check that. But this can be used in multiple ways. The first way is you can use this in Lua scripts. We'll show the Lua scripts in more detail later, but you can write a script that will run on this that can then read and write over the serial port, and you could then have an external device that could either talk to the NetIO and tell it to do things. You could have an external device connected over serial, and you could send serial commands to it to turn the outlets on and off, or to read data from it, like monitoring data for current. That could be useful in an environment where you don't want to put something like this on the network. You might just have an environment where it's really locked down or you don't have a network or something like that. You could just use this as a serial port switch, essentially. The other way you could use this is to integrate it with another device. So for example, you could have an external PDU that might have a serial interface, and you connect it up to this and have the NetIO send commands to it to control its outlets, for example. Or you can connect a sensor to this. So you can quite easily get RS-232 sensors, you can get humidity sensors, temperature sensors, stuff like that. You could plug one of those into that. You'd probably need to power it externally, but you could plug it into that and have the NetIO read data from it, such as the temperature, and then it could react accordingly based on the script. So that's really smart. The final way you can use this is just to ex is it can almost act as a serial console server. So you can connect this out to a device and then the NetIO will expose that on the network as a telnet interface. So then you telnet to a specific port on the NetIO's IP and it just gives you a console on the serial port. There's no authentication or anything like that. We'll show that in a minute. But it could be quite useful if you've got an external device that you might just want to manually control over serial and you just want some sort of console server. It can just act like that and it's just nice to have it there. You might not need it. You probably wouldn't buy this explicitly as a serial console server, but it's got that feature. So the serial port's quite nice to have. Next up, you've got a pair of Ethernet ports. These are 10100 ports, and essentially they're just switched. So you've got the internal CPU that actually is a NetIO itself. You can almost imagine this as being, say, a three-port network switch, where these two are external ports, and the third port is connected to the CPU inside this. So in most use, you'd only ever really plug one of these in. You plug one of these into your network, and it would connect the NetIO to the network. But what you could do is you could then connect another port out of this into another device. For example, you could connect another NetIO in or another PDU. You could daisy chain them if you're using the four Cs, daisy chain them through each other, and it essentially just acts as a network switch. You could probably also connect another device into this. So, say you've got the the PDU switching, say a, a, a I don't know, a, some sort of appliance that's got a network interface. You could connect that network interface into this, and then it would then connect onto the network. It's not a particularly fancy switch. It's just only ten one hundred, so. You wouldn't want to connect any servers to this, for example, but it's not really designed for server use. But it could be really useful just for maybe connecting another device through. I wouldn't use it where bandwidth or like reliability is crucial, but you've essentially just got a switched port here, which could be nice to have. Although most applications will probably just use one of them. Finally, on the front, you've got a USB port. I don't know if this is connected to anything digitally inside. On their webpage, it just says this is a 5 volt, 1 amp output, so it might purely just be a power supply output. I don't know if it is actually connected to the CPU and it could be enabled with future firmware, but I would just treat this as just, all it really is at the moment anyway, is just a 5 volt, 1 amp output. Which could be useful for, say, serial sensors, because this serial port doesn't provide power, it's just ground RX and TX. So if you did have a sensor, you might then be able to power it from USB if you need 5 volts, for example. On the bottom, let's take a quick look. We've got a sticker here, just show some information about it, nothing really. And then, what's really quite cool with this though, is it's made in the Czech Republic. So this is actually made in Europe. It's not, you know, shipped out to a factory abroad. They actually make this themselves in their own factory in Czech Republic. I think they're in Prague. 
so that's really cool to see. Then taking a look around the back, on the left we've got the power inlet, standard IC inlet with a switch to turn the power on and off. Then on the right you've got the four outlets. These are again IEC connectors so you can connect them directly into the device with the appropriate cable or you could break this out to that like a UK plug or a plug for your country and plug say power bricks in. That's all easy enough to do. And each of these is individually switched and individually current metered which is really good to have. So yeah, that's the device there. Now in terms of mounting options, this doesn't really have any out of the box, it just comes as a device on its own, but you can then buy additional mounting brackets from them. So you can either get one to mount it in a rack on its own, you can get like a side to side one where you can mount two of these side by side, or this and then their other lower end rack mount one that doesn't have as much as many APIs as this, or you can get a bracket that mounts it flush to a wall. I've not got any of them here, but I suspect they must screw in through the bottom or something, like into these or maybe little feet come off or something, because there's no lugs on the side at all, I'm not sure, quite sure how you mount onto it. But yeah, they do sell mounting brackets if you wanted them, just bear in mind they don't come with them in the box. So, you know, if you see a picture of this in that sort of rack mount form factor, it doesn't actually come with the rack ears. Now as for pricing on this, this particular model, the 4C, costs €287 Euros from NetIO's store. That's including tax, all these prices include tax. And that works out to around about £246. Now, if you're comparing this to, say, a cheap smart plug, that does sound really expensive. But for what you're getting here, that doesn't actually seem too bad. What I did is I went out and then looked at other PDUs, the ones you'd use in a data centre from the likes of APC, just to see what they were priced like, because they are I know they're expensive. Now, those PDUs generally don't go as small as four port. They start at eight port because they're designed for much larger environments with lots of servers. But looking at those, to get an APC one that has individually switched outlets and metering, although the metering is global, it only meters the whole thing, it doesn't meter the individual outlets like this one does, that would cost £610. To get one that is individually switched with eight ports and also can monitor the current individually on those ports like this one can, I could actually find one from APC that wasn't a huge vertical one. So to get an eight port one from another brand, I could find one from Austin Hughes, and that was £667. So even though those have more ports, for the features you're getting in this, with the individual current monitoring and the individually switched outlets, that is a, isn't actually that bad a price. Not to mention that compared to those data centre PDUs, this is so much easier to integrate into other systems. Another feature they advertise with this is what they call zero current switching. What this apparently means is that on the AC sine wave, it will switch the relays when the voltage is close to the zero, the zero point and apparently this massively improves the long-term reliability for the relays because they're always switching when there's well zero current so I'm not a physicist I'm not a relay designer but apparently that's what this does so that's I mean I don't know if that is a thing that makes a difference it seems like it might they had some sort of pictures of relays they've tested it with and stuff so yeah that's a nice little feature as well and something that you would get on this that you probably wouldn't get on maybe like a cheap smart plug type thing. So now, as I mentioned at the start, with this, they aren't really targeting, say, the home smart plug market, and they also aren't targeting the data centre market. They're targeting a very niche market in between. So what sort of things could you use this for? Well, I spent quite a while thinking about that because I was thinking, this is a really cool device, but what would you use it for? But I actually had a little thing, I also went through the website and found a few examples as well, so this is a mix of some that they've mentioned on the website and some that I've thought of myself. And there's actually a lot of applications where a device like this could actually be perfect. For example, one of them is things like kiosks, advertising displays and PA systems. So if you're thinking like retail or hospitality environments where you might have a PA system or you might have some big advertising screens or TVs in a bar or something like that, that you want to be able to control. Now what you could do is you could rely on someone to manually turn them on and off, but people might forget, leave the building, leave the PA system on and that's wasting energy overnight. The alternative is you could set that up on a timer, just a basic timer plug type device. But the problem with that is, is say the venue's open late one night that's later than usual, you could have the timer cut out and turn things off, or you'd have to keep updating the timing on it and stuff like that. With something like this, you could connect your PAs or your advertising displays or anything like that into this, and integrate this with another building management system. So for example, you might have a security system you can integrate this with. So when the building alarm is armed, it turns the devices off. Or you could even just have it so you can manage the schedule remotely or base it around when the buildings or rooms booked to be open. And you could have it 
control the power based on another set, another set of data like that. One other interesting example they had, I think it was in a webinar they had videos on their website, was a restaurant, I think somewhere in the UK, that was using these to control lights. And what they said they had is above each table, there was a light above each table in the restaurant, and the idea was that when a table was booked and someone was meant to be sitting at it, the light would turn on to show the table's almost reserved or in use, and when the table was free, the light would turn off. And they were using these devices integrated with their point of sale system to accomplish that. Of course it'll also work for all the standard remote reboot functionality you might need. So say you've got just a router or a bit of IT equipment that might crash occasionally and need rebooted. You could either have this set up so that you can just remotely connect in, reboot it and have it reboot from a remote location. Or you could use this as a watchdog timer. So this has a built-in watchdog timer we'll, we'll quickly look at. And it just pings the device periodically and if it stops responding to pings, it'll reboot it. But with the Lua scripting, you could add other features. For example, you could have this talk to a device over an HTTP API and check if it's online. And again, if it fails, it can reboot it. So you'd actually have this itself manually reboot devices. And I'm even just thinking of when I might use this myself. I've got a satellite box that's, that's great, but just very occasionally, maybe once every couple of months, it'll lock up. And when it locks up, it jams my HDMI control for my entire AV setup. And I have to then go in and manually go around, unplug it, plug it back in again, and it fixes it. I could just set up a watchdog timer on this, make it ping the satellite box, and if it ever crashes, reboot it. So I could even, might even use it for that myself. So that was all about the switching and the remote switching functionality this has, but it also has the current monitoring. Now, in the simplest form, that could just be used to monitor energy usage of a product. And I'm thinking just with my own usage, this could be quite cool to monitor the energy usage over a period of time. Because I've got one of those little plug-in power meters, and that's great, but you have to stand and watch it. And if you've got a device, say for example, a refrigerator or a server or a bit of AV equipment or something where the load changes over time, putting this in to monitor the current could be really cool. Because while it can't really do time series logging itself, you could have this send the time series data out over MQTT, HTTP or whatever to an external device that would then log it and you can then plot that usage over time. So that could be quite good and could potentially give a bit more information than you could just accomplish with just a little plug-in power meter. Additionally, you could use that current monitoring for fault detection. So say for example, again, you've got an advertising display or a bit of AV equipment or a lighting setup, anything like that. If you know that say your advertising TV uses 100 watts of power normally, you could have the setup and monitor that. And if the current either shoots up or drops down low, that could indicate that there's a fault with the device. For example, that display, it, its backlight might fail. And if the backlight fails, the power usage might drop, drop dramatically. If that's in a remote location, you might never notice that until someone walks up and notices it and then reports it. And then with something like a display, it doesn't usually have that sort of health monitoring to understand when it's broken. So something like this could sit in line, monitor the current usage, and if it sees a fluctuation, it could then send out an alert. So that's just another thought of something you could do with this. And it's just a very novel idea. You could have a device that just do this all standalone. So yeah, it's a very niche device. And it's the sort of thing that's quite interesting because there isn't a published use for it. It's not like this should be used for servers or this should be used for lighting. It's just this should be used for anything where you actually can think of a use for it. So there's a few examples that I came up with and then a few that I stole off their website. But it'd be really interesting to see what other ideas people have for this. You know, leave comments if you can think of other applications where something like this could be useful because it does just seem really cool. I think for me, what I'll probably end up doing is putting it as part of my AV setup, just so I can switch my subwoofer on and off based on my AV receiver being switched on and potentially remotely reboot that satellite box that keeps crashing. But what I can very much see with this is I can see myself putting this into use doing that and then a year down the line, end up taking it out again because I've suddenly come up with a situation where I need this for a much more important application because I can just totally see myself just finding a use for this very regularly. So yeah, definitely looks pretty neat and sounds pretty good on paper, but let's try it out and see how well it works. Okay, so now let's try all this out. So here's the setup. I've got the PDU here, connected to the mains and also to the network over Ethernet. Then into the back, because I needed something to demonstrate, I've gone a bit janky, and I've connected these old, two old pendant light fittings that I had, like, I think I ripped these out the flat ages ago and just had them sitting around in a cupboard. So these old pendant light fittings that then wired into IEC connectors. 
So these are literally just wired into IC connectors like that. That'll then plug into the back of the PDU. And that'll just allow me to demonstrate it because these have current that's enough that it's easy to measure. And they also can, you know, they can be very easy, they're very easy to see on camera. So that's what I'll be using to demonstrate, obviously. You'd probably, if you're buying this sort of device, you're probably going to be doing controlling more than these like manky old pendants, but it's something to test with. So that's now working and connected to the network. So what I'll do is I'll now bring up my laptop screen and I'll go through and show some of the functionality. So first of all, we'll take a look at the web interface. So here it is. There's obviously a username and password to log in. This can be accessed over HTTP or HTTPS. You can enable SSL. It'll then generate a self-send certificate itself. So you can't put your own certificates on it, but you can still access it over HTTPS if that's what you need. So here's the main screen where it shows all the outputs. You can name these if you want. They just come named output one by default, but you can click on it and you can actually change the output, change the name. There's also loads of options around here. So you can, for example, set up the power up state. So you can say that you want it to turn on when the PDU turns on, turn off when the PDU, be off when the PDU turns on, or to restore to what it was on previously, which is quite nice. So that's pretty good to have there. You can also set a schedule, so you can tell the port to turn on and off based on the schedule. So just use this as some sort of like networked timer. Here's the watchdog timer I talked about. So this is where you can tell it to ping an IP continuously, and if that IP stops responding, to power cycle the port, which is really cool as well. So let's try this out. So if we press the button here, that'll turn output one on, and then do the same on output two, and now they're both turned on. If we close out of this, you can then see we have the current monitoring. So we can see it's telling us that output one is drawing 13 watts, output two is drawing 12 watts, and that's 0 0.8 amps and 0 0.7 amps respectively. Oh, sorry, 0 0.08 and 0 0.08. Yeah, they're going up and down. But what's really good with this is the precision. My APC PDU can only measure like one decimal point, so it can measure essentially in 100, 100 milliamp increments, whereas this can measure in 10 milliamp increments. So that's 10 times more precise. A lot of that's just due to the target market. If you're making a PDU designed to power servers that use hundreds of watts, you know, a few milliamps either way isn't going to make a difference. But for something like this that might be powering quite low current loads, it's actually really good to see that level, level of precision. Additionally, it also monitors the power factor of each port, which is really cool. So you can calculate the actual power and then it, total ups, it totals up the watt hours so you can view a sort of total count of how many watt hours have been used and you can reset that in the settings. Then down here globally, it monitors the total current, total power, total energy, which is just totaled up, overall power factor, and it also monitors the mains voltage and the mains frequency. So that's really cool. So it gives a lot of information here. And of course, while this is available in the web interface, this is also available over the APIs. So that's the outlets on. You've also got other options here. For example, you've got this button here that will reset the port. So you press that, hit, hit reset, turn the port off for a period of time, and it'll bring it back on again. And that's basically what you would need if you want to remotely reboot a port. And you can change that delay in here. Now, the one thing I can't see, at least in this interface, although it will be possible with other things we'll talk about in a minute, I can't see a way to phase the power on, such as setting up a delay on each of these ports on to, uh, around how long it will take to initially start up. This can be good if you've got loads where you've got, got a high inrush current. So you might have four devices connected that have a really high inrush current that would be more than the 10 amps that this device can take, or potentially more than whatever your circuit can take. Turning all those on at once could end up blowing a fuse or tripping a circuit breaker. But if you phase the power on and turn one on every 10 seconds, you get around that. That's a feature that lots of server PDUs have because that can be a big problem with data centers. This doesn't have it as a nice user interface option. You know, I can't see a way here just to set a delay that says how long it turns up, takes to turn on. But you could, of course, set that up in the Lua scripting. So we'll take a look at Lua, Lua scripting later and it'll be very clear how you would write a script to do that. So it's not bad that it doesn't have it. You could just set it up in a Lua script. But it would be nice to just have a little user interface element just for each of these where, for example, output power up state, you could set that to on and then you could also provide a delay as to how long it took before it turned on. So it doesn't have that, but it's not the end of the world. However, that said, if you've got it set to turn the outlets on on boot, it will phase the out, it will phase the power on maybe like half a second or so in between. So it does at least do something. So it, it does do it by default. It would just be nice if you could actually configure it as well. 
but let's take a look at the APIs this supports because that's where this thing really shines. So first of all, if we come over to here, M2M API protocols, that's machine to machine API protocols. First of all, we've got SNMP. That's a system for integrating with existing monitoring systems. So if you've got a system like Zabbix or Nagios or something like that that monitors your environment, you can use SNMP and it can help systems like that pull data off in a standardized way. It's common on things like network switches as well to support that. We won't really look at that here though. Next up, you've got Telnet interface. So you have to enable all these individually. I've enabled them all and set them up. But you enable Telnet interface, give it a port you want to use. So we can pull up a shell here and we can Telnet to the IP address of the device and then port 1234 takes me in. First of all, we need to log in. So we can issue login admin admin, that's the username and password. I'm now logged in. And we can issue commands to control the device. For example, port 11 will turn port 1 on. Port 10 will turn port 1 off. Port 2, 1 will turn port 2 on. All that sort of stuff. You can also control groups of ports. For example, if I were to type port list 1111, that'll turn all the ports on. Of course, you only see the two that I've got connected, but if you actually look down here, there's LEDs in the front that have gone green. They've all gone green to show the ports are all on. Or you can go, for example, port list 0000, port list 1010, will turn on ports 1 and 3. So you can do things like that. So you can control them in bulk over a single command as well, which is really cool. So this is really good to have. So that's the Telnet interface. And as you can see, you can set all the port states from it. You can also use it to read port states. So if I were to log in again, because it timed out, you can say port one, and it'll tell me port one is on. If I then say port two, it'll tell me port two is off. So that's how that works. But what you'll notice with this is this is machine usable. So a machine can write these commands to the Telnet interface and it can control it. What you can even do is you can even pack these commands down into a single binary string. So you can set, essentially create a string of login admin admin new line character port 11 new line character and send that over a socket and control it. So you can control it just with raw sockets without even needing to like time stuff or send commands one after the other. You can send it with a single, HD, a single TCP packet which can be really good to integrate with other devices. Whereas if we look at my APC PDU, which is a great PDU, this is the Telnet interface and it's a menu system. So if I want to reboot a port, I have to press one for device manager, press enter, press three for outlet control configuration, press enter, press eight to pick the right outlet, press enter, press one for control outlet, press enter. And then I want to do an immediate reboot, so I have to press three, enter, type in the word yes, press enter, and then press enter again, and that's now rebooted that output. Which is fine if you're a user wanting to use it, but if you wanted to control this from software and script that sort of interaction, it's a nightmare. And I know that because I've done it with this thing before. You've essentially got to issue commands and then put delays in your code to wait and then issue the next command as you navigate through the menu. And it's just these commercial PDUs for data centers, they're just not designed for that sort of application where you want to actually control it through software. The next protocol we'll take a look at is MQTT. And this is a message bus protocol. So the way this works is you have a server called a broker that runs, lots of devices connect to it, and they publish messages on topics. So what you do is you have a topic that's just a forward slash separated string, and you send data to it. And then other devices can subscribe to those topics, so it can subscribe to that topic string. And then when any, any device pushes to that, publishes to that topic, every subscribed device receives that message. And it's a way of linking different devices together. And we can try that out. And the cool thing with this is this is very widely deployed. I even have an MQTT setup in my own flat that I use for my home automation system for my central heating. So I can actually connect it to that. So this is my existing MQTT setup I already had, where I've just simply specified the IP of the broker and the port it runs on. There's no authentication on mine. And when we save the changes, we can now try this out. So down here, we can pull up some software. This is just MQTT Explorer. It just lets you see what messages are going over the bus. Here, for example, we can see there's already my home automation system. It's already there's the stuff from my home automation system already passing through the system. But the NetIO is publishing under devices, NetIO, messages, and we go into here, and we can see what it's doing is it's sending out the current consumption. And every time this updates, it sends out a new message and we can see it's updating here. So you could have another device that supports MQTT, which could subscribe to this topic and will automatically receive the messages coming from the NetIO around its power consumption, its outlet states, and all that sort of stuff. 
You can also send MQTT messages to the NetIO and have it respond to them. I'm not, I've not tried it, but I think you can just send messages directly to its own topic and it will pick them up. But what you can also do is you can use the Lua scripting to subscribe to topics and then you can create a script that will, when it receives an MQTT message, it can interpret it and process it that way. So you could actually integrate this with an existing system. So for example, if I wanted this to turn on and off with my central heating, I could create a Lua script that subscribes to one of my central heating topics, reads the data from it, and switches the outlets accordingly. So if you've got, already got an MQTT setup, or you're using software such as um, Node-RED, you could really quite easily integrate this with your existing system, which is really cool to see. And it's just awesome to have that built into the device. We've then got the serial console. We'll take a look at that later because it requires a bit of additional plugging in. But then we've got the JSON API, the XML API, and the URL API. So the JSON API is probably the most useful one, or the XML one. They're both basically the same. They just one uses JSON, one, one uses XML. In this video, we'll take a look at the JSON one just because JSON's much nicer to work with than XML. So in here, you can enable the API. You can create users, so you can have a read-only user or a read-write user, so that's really good. You can separate the two, which is fantastic. And what you can also do, you can see here, is you can set a custom HTTP port. And this is common across all the HTTP APIs. What this means is you can have one port that's on port 80, for example, or 443 if you're using, using SSL, that has the NetIO web interface. So this interface here can be running on that port. You can then create a sep set this up on a separate port so the API listens on a different port. And that means if you've got a device that needs to connect to the API, you could install a firewall in between and firewall off access to this management interface and only allow access to the API. So that's good from a network security perspective and that definitely is right up my street having that feature there. So now we can try this API out. So now let's quickly try out the JSON API. So we're going to use a software I've got called HTTPy or HTTPPy, I can't remember, don't know how to pronounce it, just like JSON HTTP requests. So the simplest form, we can issue a GET request using the read user, and that will provide all this data. So we get JSON data back, and that shows us each outlet. So it shows the current consumption of that outlet, all zero at the moment because they're all switched off, the total power usage, the state of the output to show if it's on or off, the outlet name, all that sort of stuff. And it also shows the other system stats, such as the mains frequency, the mains voltage, the system's uptime, all that sort of stuff. What we can also do, though, is we can issue POST requests to change, change settings. For example, if we issue this request here, that sets outlet ID action one, that'll turn outlet one on. There's also other actions you can supply. So for example, here we've got action three, that will toggle it. So it'll turn it on, and after five seconds, it'll turn it off again. And that's all well and good. But what you can also do is you can supply other arguments along with that. For example, here, we're supplying a delay. So rather than using that five second delay that's defined in the web interface, we'll drop that delay down to a thousand. So that's one second. So if we now run it, run that, it'll turn on and turn off much quicker. And what you can also do with this is you can control multiple outlets at a time. So for example, with this command, we're going to say we want to do action three. So that's a power cycle of outlet one for a second. So it'll turn outlet one on for a second and turn it off. And at the same, in the same request, we want to turn outlet two on permanently. And if we run that request, they both turn on, and after a second, outlet one turns off. So that's the JSON API. It's really flexible, so you can control multiple outlets at a time, or one. You can also reboot them and toggle them. Uh, toggle the other one I didn't show. So we can, for example, use this one here, where we issue an action of four, and all that does is it just toggles the outlet. So rather than explicitly saying on or off, you just issue that command, and it'll turn the state to the op toggle the state to the opposite one from what it was on at the start. So that's the JSON API, and it's really cool. So while this can't change things like the device settings, it can read all the data, it can read the power monitoring, it can read the states and all that sort of stuff, and you can also use it to control the device, as well as it being authenticated. So that's really good to have. And as I mentioned, you've got the XML API. I haven't tried that myself, but as far as I can tell, it's basically the same. It's just going to use the XML protocol instead of the JSON protocol. I mean, if you open that up, you can just see there's a JSON, that you're, the XML you're reading out from it. But I'm not going to make myself suffer trying to actually send XML to, uh, XML to it. I'll just show the JSON one. Next up, you've got the URL API. This is a very lightweight API. 
So what this does here is we enable that, we give it a pass phrase, and we've got this, this endpoint. And all you do is we say, click that, and that turns it on and off. And all this does is this can just work through like a get request. So you can see up here, we're putting the pass phrase in the get request, which isn't best practice, but that's fine. It's just very lightweight. And we can specify out, output one equals four. So that toggles output one. In the same way, we say output, output two, zero, turn output two off, and it will do it. So this is a much lighter weight way of doing it. So all you need is a device that can provide an HTTP GET request. That's literally all you need. And you can just provide the passphrase and a simple bit of, a simple parameter in the URL and make it control a device. And this is also really good, especially if you want to control this from a low power device, such as a microcontroller, which might not have enough power to process things like JSON. As long as it can provide, has enough power to issue a GET request, you could use this API to control the device, which is really cool. Now the next protocol we have is Modbus TCP. Now this is something I hadn't really heard of before at all, but it's something used in industrial control. So it's used quite often for like program PLCs and programmable logic controllers to talk to each other. So it's a very common industrial protocol. It's something I've never used myself, but we may as well take a look at it. So what we go do, is if we go down here, we can see if we can enable it. So we can enable a port for it to listen on. You can allow it to control, enable write, so you can allow it to change the outputs, or you can disable that and just allow it to read and nothing else. And I think you can filter it to only allow certain IPs to connect because there's no authentication available on it. And this seems to be quite a sort of long-term established, very low level, old school protocol. So I don't necessarily know how to work it. So here I've got an app on my phone called Modbus TCP, I think, something like that. And we can connect that. So you can press open, that'll connect to the device. And we can now issue Modbus requests. Now, I don't really know what I'm doing here, but I've quickly looked through the manual. So the read coils function will allow us to read outlet state. So if I put the address of 101, that's the first outlet, send that command, and it'll return this big array and the last digit represents the outlet state. So you can see for outlet one, it's on. If you change that to 102, which will go to outlet two, which is switched off currently, send that, you'll see the last digit will change to zero, showing the outlet's off. Similarly, we can go to read input registers, I think it is, and read the current. So if you read it for outlet two, there's nothing, it's not switched on. But if you read outlet one, you see the last digit shows the current, so that's 76. And if it issue enough things, you can see that's changing as the bulbs drawing a slightly different current. So that works there. And finally, we can also change it. So we can go to like write single coil. 101 is one, is port one. So we can press off, send that turns off, send that turns on, change address to 102, and send an on to that, and it'll turn the outlet on. So that's Modbus TCP. It's a very low level protocol, so it's something I don't really understand or have much experience with myself. But if you have a system where you need, not, need Modbus TCP, this device can support it, which is really cool. So next up, we've got one of the key features this has, which is built-in Lua scripting. So you can write little Lua scripts in, in the Lua programming language that will run on the device itself. So whereas a lot of the time with other systems, what you'd have to have is a server or a Raspberry Pi or some sort of computer running code that's checking an API or doing something that makes decisions and then interfaces with the PDU. With this, you can write little scripts that actually do quite a lot of stuff that make the PDU do actions like this totally stand alone. So here's one example they give you on the on their website. There's a lot of examples they provide, which is really cool. This one just provides a, a simple HTTP API. Well, I won't demonstrate this, but you can just issue HTTP requests. It will process information in the request and act accordingly. And this means that you don't have to use the APIs that they give you. You could write your own API that handles an incoming request and you can then do a bit more, just some slightly smarter stuff with it. I won't bother demonstrating this one, but you can see here's some triggers. So this is where you can set when your codes to run. So for example, you have system started up, which is what you would use if you want to either do something on startup or if you want a bit of code that runs continuously. You can do things when an outlet's changed. You can do things based on serial data. You can do things based on the power man measurement changing. So everything the power measurement changes, it that runs a bit of code accordingly. It's really pretty smart. Also MQTT stuff, so you can make it subscribe to topics, handle incoming MQTT messages, etc. So what we'll do is we'll take a look at a rule that I built. So it's this one here called current-based switching. It runs on startup. Now, in hindsight, I should have used power measurements changed, but we'll just ignore that. We'll treat this as a learning exercise. So on startup, what this does is it runs this function here, 
which checks the power consumption on port 1, and if the current consumption on port 1 is above 10 watts, it's measuring watts here, it'll switch outlet 2 on. If port 1 is using less than 10 watts, it turns outlet 2 off. And then it will wait 100 milliseconds and run that function again. And this is the way you're meant to do it if you just want something to run continuously over and over again with a delay in between. So with this running, if I come up to the device here, what we can do is we can unplug outlet 1, outlet 2 turns off, plug outlet 1 in, turns on. And likewise, if I was to hold the button down here, it'll turn outlet 1 off, that one switches off. So this is almost like those AV power strips you used to get, I think you can still get them, where you've got like one port that you plug your TV into and another port you're meant to say plug your amplifier into and then it'll turn your amplifier off when your TV goes off. They used to be very popular back in like the early 2000s I remember. It's basically one of those now but a lot smarter. But with something like this you could phase power on of different things, you could have things where devices have, where if a device is drawing extra power it turns on a cooling fan, there's all sorts of things you could do. You could also do things like load sharing, so you could have, if, if you've got a limited current supply, you could have something that if one of the ports starts drawing too much current, it turns something else off, or if there's extra headroom capacity, it could turn extra devices on. You could do all sorts of stuff like that. It's really, really flexible. The only thing I've found with this that's a little bit annoying is that when you change one of these rules, it's really only the system startup rules, I think. I think some of the other ones as well. Is When you change a rule like the system startup rule, you then have to reboot the device to make it apply. So if I wanted to change this current limit here, I'd have to change it, save the changes, and then reboot the device. It's not the end of the world, but the only thing to bear in mind is that you, I, I can't seem to find anything in the web interface here to let you reboot it from the web interface. I imagine it's something they might add in the future, or could add in the future if it was a problem. So you do have to reboot it on the NetIO itself, which is a little bit annoying if this was, say, in a remote location. But it is possible, you just have to manually you just have to come over here and actually reboot it yourself, which is a little bit annoying. That's definitely a bit of a gripe I have with it. Now the final script I'll show is actually one of the ones I could see this being really useful for. And that is that this can make outgoing HTTP requests. In a lot of environments, you might have a device like this sitting behind a firewall or behind NAT. It might, might be on a cellular connection where you cannot get a public IP address to this device that you could port forward through. or you know, so if you want to manage this remotely, you'd have to have some sort of VPN set up to let you connect in and issue commands to it. And that's what you'd have to do with most PDUs. But with this one, you could instead have an API hosted separately on a server that could be in the cloud, it could be in your own data center, as long as it's accessible over the internet. And you could then have your PDU itself make requests to that API and act accordingly. So here I've written a very simple request. And all this does is it provides is it calls a URL endpoint I'm hosting on my laptop that just sends either on or off as a string. And if it's on, it turns all the outlets on. If it's off, it turns all the outlets off. But this is just good from a network perspective because now you no longer need to have some way to directly access the NetIO itself. It can just talk to your API so it can set, so as long as it can access the internet, it can operate. So here's the example. So down here we've got my terminal. So you can see here we've got the web server running and you can see that every second or every, every two seconds, we're getting a pull request from the NetIO asking for what it's to do. It's just serving a text file, it's very low tech. So currently that text file says off. So if we just change that to say on, and then we write the file, all the outlets turn on. And if we turn that to off, write that again, all the outlets turn off. So that's just another really smart way you can use something like this. Because now you no longer need to worry about having to having network access to it. You don't need to be able to connect in over the public internet or have a VPN into it. You can essentially just have an API hosted anywhere on the internet, and as long as you can give this device some sort of internet connection, it can operate based on it. You can also even connect this to external APIs. So you no longer need an external server there running code that's then controlling this. This thing can be totally self-sufficient. So now for the final interface, we'll take a look at the serial port. I've got this connected up to my laptop, just using this basic USB serial adapter. And all I've done is connected the ground to this, the RX on the NetIO to the TX on the converter, and the TX on the NetIO to the RX on the converter, so you just cross them over. Of course, you'd probably want to connect it to something a bit fancier. But that's all I need to do here. And now if you come over to the laptop and take a look at what it has, you can see we have a configuration here. So you can either turn the serial port off, you can use it in Lua actions, or you can access it over the network. 
So first of all, we'll take a look at Lua script. So here you can set what type of Uline character you use. I'm just gonna use carriage return because I'm on a Unix system. So that's what I'll be using there. Windows would be CRLF. And then while this doesn't have a built-in serial console itself, like no, there's no way to out of the box manage it over serial, NetIO do provide a Lua script, this one here, that you can simply paste in basically. And that will provide a serial console interface that's very similar to the Telnet one. So now if we pull up a terminal, pull up Minicom here, we're connected in. So in theory, if I, yep, we can see we're running. So if I was typing port one one, port one zero, ah, um, because it's it doesn't support backspace just because it's serial. But there we go. Or you can I think you can also do port list. We'll list all the ports. Port list one 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 one. Set some switch them all on. So yeah, it's actually pretty cool. So this is just a basic serial interface. But what you can see here is I have a device here on my laptop that's able to send text to the NetIO and receive responses back. And that could work the opposite way around. The NetIO could send requests to my laptop, my laptop could honour them. So this shows how you could connect a sensor. Rather than this connecting to a laptop, you could have some sort of sensor here or some environment monitoring appliance. And you could talk to that over serial and read data about the temperature in the environment, humidity, power consumption from another meter, whatever you want. It's really flexible. For example, you can even I don't know, connect this to a UPS, and if the UPS tells us it's running on battery power, this could then go, okay, you're running on battery power, and start turning devices off, or it could turn them off on a schedule, or it's really super flexible having the serial interface here. Another use I saw for the serial port on the on the NetIO website was you could actually use it to connect a switch. And I can actually just kind of see what they're going from, is you could create two Lua, Lua actions, one that constantly sends text over the serial port, another one that constantly looks for that text coming back on the serial port. And then all you need to do is put a switch between the RX and the TX pins, and when that switch is on, the text going out would come back in, and you could pick that up. So you could use that if you wanted to connect a physical like rocker switch to the device. Now of course you are then sending digital bytes through that switch, but that would probably work. Now the other option you have is rather than, is in here, rather than having the serial console used for MQTT script, uh, sorry, Lua actions, you can instead set it to access over the network as a remote serial port. So if we save those changes there, that will now expose the serial port on the IP of the NetIO on port 45000. So if we pull up a terminal again, here we can see we've got mini term, mini com here. And if we open up this terminal here, we can now tell net to 10114 Zero one eight nine, but rather than just going to the normal port, which is just going to be the telnet port on this that manages the device, we're instead going to go to port four five zero zero zero. And now my telnet session is connected to the serial port. So if I type in the telnet session and press enter, you'll see it will appear on the serial console. And likewise, if I type into this here, it appears here. So you can use this to actually send data both ways. So with this, you can just use it as like a serial console server. I mean, it's not a device designed for that. I mean, if you're wanting to manage a lot of devices over serial, you're probably better buying a serial console server. But I'm just imagining again, if you're in a situation, for example, yeah, this is controlling some sort of kiosk or some sort of network appliance or some sort of public display, that device itself might have a serial management port and it might not have any sort of network management at all. So having a device like this that's already there controlling and monitoring its power and just being able to run a simple serial cable into it and have this also act as a serial console server could be incredibly useful. The only thing to bear in mind is, is that this console server doesn't have any sort of authentication. There's no way to authenticate with it. So your device connected to it would either have to handle the authentication itself or you're going to be exposing it unauthenticated. But that is just, it's one of those sort of things that they've, it's not a main feature of this device, it's not a big selling point, it's not something that people are probably going to look for in this device necessarily. But they've obviously they've got the hardware for it, the software probably doesn't take that much effort to implement, so why not put the feature on it? So yeah, that is a really nice little feature there. Just a nice little quirk, quirk sort of addition to have. So there we go, that's all the APIs it supports. Also, I discovered a very interesting quirk about that power switch that I just literally discovered while filming. And that is that it doesn't work how I thought it did. I thought that power switch was essentially just isolation for the mains going in, but it actually seems to be more the power supply to the internal controller. 
Because if I turn that power switch off, the outlets stay on. Or the outputs stay on. Now obviously if I then unplug the mains, they turn off and all the relays click off. But then if I plug it back in with that switched off, there's a little pause, and the outlets come back on. And this is using that state that I had set where you can specify that you want the outlets to turn on remembering their last state. That means that even with the main controller off, it still seems to turn the outlets on correctly. So there must be something, well it'd be interesting to see when we take it apart, there must be some sort of separate microcontroller that handles the outlets, out, outlet control versus the main CPU. And of course if you then turn the main CPU on using the switch, it'll beep, it'll start up, the lights come on and it'll connect to the network after a while. This is quite good because it does mean that if the main processor crashes or needs rebooted, you can actually do that just using the switch on the back and it doesn't affect the outputs, which is really good to see. It also somewhat alleviates that, or it doesn't, it it's improves slightly on that issue I mentioned earlier where you have to reboot it to apply some of the Lua scripts, because at least you can do that by just toggling that and it will reboot the controller, but it won't necessarily power cycle your outputs. It's still annoying you can't do it remotely because it means you physically have to be next to the device to do it, but it's nice enough to have. Now, as I do with most of my videos, I'd love to do a teardown of this. However, as I'm saying this, I'm actually currently editing it and this video is already going far too long. So I'm not going to put this teardown in this video. What I'll do is in the next video, I'll upload it in just a couple of days or even the next day after this one, I won't wait that long. I'll release a little extra video where we do a teardown. And as a spoiler, this thing's pretty neat inside. So there you go. That's been a look at the NetIO PowerPDU 4C. And I have to say, this has been a fascinating little device to look at. I have to say a massive thank you to, to NetIO for sending this over because I've really enjoyed playing with this. And I just love how it's such a easily integratable device. I've had so much, spent so much time mucking about with devices where you're trying to reverse engineer protocols or bodge them to get them to work. So getting an off the shelf device like this that can just integrate with so many different systems in a really easy to use way, it's absolutely brilliant. So I'm really sort of looking forward to trying to figure out how I can use this myself. I think I'll probably put it first of all just in my AV setup, just so I can have my AV receiver switch on a couple of things when I turn it on, and then maybe have a watchdog timer to reset my satellite box. But I can't wait to see what I'm going to end up using this for in the future, because I can totally see myself repurposing this and finding other uses for it. So yeah, thank you very much for watching. This video has been an absolute epic, I'm sure. It's probably going to be very long. But if you've stayed to the end, thank you very much for watching. And if you're interested in buying this, I'll put a link in the description.